la di la di la di la. School of school of school of schools. University of the Underground. From the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. The subject this week is reverse engineering economic mania. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the School of School of Schools. We are on day five of our program, The School of Consumption. So far, what have we already had, Jack? We've already had um, day number one was School of Influence. Day number two was School of Inspiration Individuals. School number three was School of the Invisible. School number four was School of Value. And what's today, Joe? Today, again, is the School of Consumption. Oh. We are the University of the Underground. We are from the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam, and we have been here tasked with the mission of coming up with alternative economic models. So now, today, we have our final one. Are you ready? Very ready, very, very confident. Final two? Oh, that's true. We've got two. Sorry, sorry, Ryan. Okay, so I would like to welcome Arsla Dinch and Heather Griffin and Maria. What's your surname, Anna Maria? Merkel. Very good. And Avita Liger. So, for a radio play, from Perform Istanbul. Let's go. Congratulations. Hello and welcome. We're coming to you live from the Istanbul Biennale, School of Schools of Schools, based in Arter, an art gallery in the heart of Istikal Kedisi, a truly vibrant street of consumption, descended upon by almost three million people a day. I must say, a perfect location for our school of consumption. Today, we are discussing economic mania, bubbles, and alternatives to the current system, if we dare to speculate on such a thing. The Dutch and Turkish connection is stemming from the 17th century tulip mania, considered to be the first economic bubble and the origin of speculative trading methods still practiced today. The media industry has been accused of blowing bubbles, also, but not this objective news source. Joining us today from the melting pot of the Orient Occident is a very special guest, someone whose influence is omnipresent in our daily transactions, yet very few have interacted with them directly. They keep a watchful eye over the markets and are an institution of governance and administration with eyes and ears spanning the globe, making sure everything is moving along the right track. Descendants of Mercury, god of trade, and Midas, the cursed king. A hybrid fusion of capital and state. Welcome, Eminem. So I must start, you guys look fabulous today. Who are you wearing? Oh, well, I'm, I'm wearing Yeezy. Yeezy. Ye yeah, Yeezy, Yeezy. And it's, I mean, I find it very difficult uh, for myself to, to get suitable or fitting clothing. So my very good friend, Kani West, um, they designed this wonderful masterpiece for me. And... Benim yakın arkadaşım, Kanya West. Tasarladı, Kanya. Evet. And also, it does have my favorite accessory, which is the wings. Maybe you should just put this a bit closer to us, because it's really hard. Yeah. Tell me about it. Jeans are the worst for me. Uh, but you haven't mentioned that shiny object in your hand. May I ask what it is? Well, yeah, you, you, I mean, I brought this wonderful bubble because you explained we, we're going to talk about bubbles, so I thought I'd bring my own. And um, to also quickly explain what a bubble is, because it's kind of complex, and I will try to put it really simply. A bubble is a surge on the market which is caused by speculation and regarding a certain commodity. So let's say um, a stripy tulip. And this causes an explosion of activity in the market. And demand begins to exceed and causes um, 
a really tremendous inflation of prices. And these expensive and excessive prices, for example, one tulip costing the same as a house, um, well, they are not really sustainable and they're, they're causing the market to become unstable. And this is then where the bubble busts, which is also known as a crash. Yeah. Indeed, your bubble isn't at all transparent. Well, um, so just, sorry, one thing that I'm just a little bit unclear about. Who's regulating the market? I mean, can prices be capped to avoid a crash? Güzel soru, güzel soru. Evet, bu karmaşık bir sistem ama tüm sistemlerde olduğu gibi bunda da kurallar, düzenlemeler mevcut tabii ki. Ee, ve serbest pazarın her zaman kendi kendini belirleyeceğinden emin olabilirsiniz. Well, actually, well, the market, you know, it's a self-repairing system and it will always fix itself, obviously. So no one is to blame and also nothing is to worry. Everything is fine. Everything is good. That's reassuring. Okay. Um, I noticed the objects actually you're holding. They've got a golden hue. Are they real gold? Gerçek altın tabii ki. Ben de şöyle bir genetik hastalık var. Dokunduğum her şey altına dönüşüyor. Actually, I wouldn't say it's. I mean, turning gold out of objects or turning objects into gold is not a condition, right? It's um, I create assets. Evet, servet yaratıyorum. Yeah. And I take them also. Okay. Interesting skill or condition, as you call it. Um, but let's move on to talk about the current economic model and its flaws. Well, I mean, I can, I can try to explain that, yeah? Let me try to explain it by telling you a simple story by using the microcosmos of one of Istanbul's most famous bridges as an analogy for the system, explaining it in a way that you, I mean the people, will understand. Evet, Galata Köprüsü'nden İstanbul'un tarihi ve ticari sistemini görebiliriz. Yeah, so what I wanted to say is, um, the Galata Bridge is crossing the Golden Horn and yeah, and it is the bay between uh, old Constantinople and the former foreigner's quarter, Galata. And um, it is the fifth of its kind also, and it always has been used as a natural bay for ships to pass through. Um, however, all these bridges, you know, they never were only bridges, they were really their own neighborhood. Um, and they had like a really own economic system themselves like a microcosmos of really small businesses, as well as it, it was a really busy boulevard, and it still is a busy boulevard, lined with really colorful um, restaurants and bars, well, and, re çok and, and um, the life on that bridge is also like super disorganized. I mean, it seems, and actually this is also what it is. And, um, but is it also, I mean, the whole life, this whole chaos is really also subject to a, very, very clear structure and runs according to very, um, let's say, social patterns um, that are a kind of economic segregation. Yeah, and it's, it's originated and founded by itself. So trade in general is really strictly gener uh, regulated. So make me an example. The fish sellers from the left side, they're all coming from the same city or like the same village whereas the fried fish sellers from the other side are all coming from another village, which is a different village than the village from the fish sellers of the first side on the other side. And then also the lures, the hooks, the spoons in the mouth of the caught fish, they're all from the same salesman from Erzincan. Erzincan. Erzin, um, Erzincan. In, yeah, and um, the fishing tackle, for example, is sold by immigrants then from Kamasta, Kam, Kamasta, Kastamonu. Kastamonu, and um, others can't get any foothold. I mean, nothing. They can't get any foothold in that industry. It's absolutely impossible, um, especially no Kurds because they're only allowed to trade cigarettes and tobacco on that bridge. And I mean, then this again, this is their very, their very exclusive right though. So yeah, 
merchants on, to finish up, I, I'm going to be quick now. I mean, to finish Please. up, yeah, the merchants on the upper street, they are often related and have literally inherited their work. So that means, like, for example, I, yeah, I know their fathers and grandfathers, and, um, and they all come uh, from the same southern parts of the country, though. <laughs> and finally, the home villages, you know, the home villages of the two tea brewers, they are located close to the Iranian border, and should a tea brewer from a different origin should try to steal their customers, you know, they get problems. It's really, like, it's, there's a really strict system behind. And, uh, yeah, they're going to be banished from the bridge, even. So what I want to say is the existence of these microsystems are really dependent on customers. So it's basically people like you and you and you and okay. you thanks and also you. thank you Eminem. And I'm and just going to have to interrupt you like really really quickly we're going to we'll be back after this super short break seeking the next big thing then you need disruption are you skilled enough to move fast and break things first to saturate the market wins become the ultimate disruptor disruption feeling guilty you may be suffering from SCCGS. Jerry Mantra, solutions-based practitioner, is here to help. Hey guys, I'm out here and we're going to be doing a great exercise. It's going to be a premium paid video, so make sure that you check out the webpage to subscribe for it. This is going to be one of the weekly routines that you can do to absolve yourself of your consumer complicity guilt or... Uh, well, anyway, and I hope that you have a good rest of your day and be sure to check in for more updates. I hope that you're doing good and thank you so much for your support. I feel very blessed to be here. So thank you so much and see you around. Okay, well, bye bye. And subscribe uh, now we'll at Jerry Mantra. That is okay, at J E R R Y M A T R A. Now that's clean living. And we're back. I'm actually looking forward to Jerry Mantra's uh, Black Friday guilt solutions. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, maybe Shh. I can quickly finish the story, just really briefly. I'm going to be super quick, but this is really important. Of course, please do. It is um, fascinating. I just want to say, like, the bridge is spanned by a network, yeah, and a sy it's like a kind of system even, and uh, of really small com uh, communities from very different <laughs> migrants whose respective models of behavior are defined and inscripted in the stone and metalwork of the bridge. And I believe also this network is not just limited to that bridge. No, no, no. It's like basically spanned yeah, throughout the entire city and it weaves a spider web where like, the innocent children, they fall into that web like helpless butterflies. And... They, they really, like, even before they are born, they are fallen to that web and they have to fight a lifetime, yeah, with the sticky threads that try on to hold their really delicate wings. And, yeah, I mean, the goods you are able to trade in your lifetime, they are predefined before you're even able to touch this earth. They're just, and, and change is really hard, really hard to achieve. It's possible, but it's, it's really hard to achieve. And that is basically the, the problem, no? Okay, thank you. But I guess my question is. Thank you. So, yeah, when did we reach this point of no return? Um, well, you see, the capitalist system pushes us that everything um, has a price. Um, and value, even. Value, even value has a price tag, you know? Yani belli bir miktarda e, para hayatımızdaki şeylere yüklediğimiz değerle örtüşür mü? Bunu mu diyordum? Well, value is measured um, by how useful or desirable a good or a service is. Like for example, we can talk about worth. Um, or wait, wait, wait, basically, no, no, no. Let me start again. When we talk about worth, we are talking. Um, about the viewpoint of the owner and speculating about the possible sale. Price and worth are similar, but the true price only exists when we are actually selling, whereas we can speculate about worth at any time. Uh, evet, evet, değeri uh, zaman içinde sabit, 
ve içsel görüyoruz. Ama e, araştırmalar gösteriyor ki e, bireysel tercihler ve sosyal bağlamlar içinde değer bunlara bağımlı olmalı. Yeah, I agree actually. What value is intrinsic in one sense, but I also agree that it can change depending on individual preferences and social context. But maybe let me ask this. If you can imagine a possible future where money doesn't count and maybe the people get to put their value on items and exchanges instead of the markets, well, what well, do you think would happen? No, well, basically we're gonna have then anarchy. Anarchy in terms of price regulations, yeah, it's the worst. Now we have basically a uh, circle of cycles uh, of, yeah, of, of, I mean, greed is good, yeah. Money makes the world go around, the world go around, the world go around. Money makes evet, the world go evet, around. Evet, iştah iyidir uh, dediğim gibi. Uh, sürekli sözümü kesiyorsun. Yeah, you can just stop putting words in my mouth, yeah? You're doing it the full time. Kendi, kendi no, kendim koyabilir you can yani. just stop putting words in my mouth. You have been interrupting me. Like, Hayır, sen benim sözümü kesip stop. Dur. stop. Dude, you can just stop. stop. Yeah, stop, stop, and just shut up. And Ay, you, you, shut up. no, like ya? seriously. Hayır, did you recognize? Did you Sürekli recognize that? Şey no, I yani. mean, I, I don't know, understand, but I'm really sorry ben for this. Oh. Okay, okay. Th thank you, M and M, for that insightful. Uh, I don't know, interview information on the market. We're going to wrap this up with this uh, ad from our sponsor, Shell. And that's all from the first edition of School of Consumption. Thanks to our guest M&M, and thank you all for joining us. Ooh, oh yeah, thank you very much. That's thank good. you very much. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you, Aishal. Thank you, Avita. And thank you, Perform Istanbul. That was a really amazing thing. And what an amazing costume. Pretty good. Okay, right. So now, we have a few minutes. Do we have any questions? Any questions from the crowd? Oh, we yeah, have sure. I'm, I'm, I'm close. Thank you for that. I, um, you were talking about the relationship between media. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned the relationship between media and economic bubbles. Maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, it was a Nobel Prize winning economist, Robert Schiller, in 2013 that claimed um, that actually bubbles didn't exist uh, pre-media. And the first bubble occurred in uh, the Netherlands, which was also a publishing capital at that point. So there was basically a lot of media about the bubble. And they're saying then from now on, media actually does influence bubbles quite often, and quite a bit. That's bit simply put. I, will, I have a follow-up question. I mean, because then it's come up, uh, when we talk about media in this sense, you talk about um, kind of a mass attention, but how does it kind of at the concrete media um, of today, the new media, the internet, how is that, does that relate to bubbles? Um, my research uh, was more into uh, commercial media. So as you see important people, get hyped as, for example, Elon Musk, and um, when he Twitters, the shares uh, of Tesla go up or down, what we had, um, I think, two, mo two, two months ago. So my investigation was more on that. 
So it was um, really interesting to see how the influencer aspect of the media. So when we, we were in collaboration with the correspondent, the alternative newspaper, so they go more into longer stories and less hyping and influencing. So it is really well researched. And as we see with the commercial media, it is a complete... Uh, other way because it's like 24 hour news it's very quick so actually sometimes these discussions are um, displayed in the media and that influences the view of people and so that's as well what we um, researched on um, doing this show it was the idea to show this influencer aspect to hype a certain situation and we got probably to explain a bit we got a bit into mythology so it's King Midas who turns, it's a Midas touch, he turns uh, things into gold. And we have here Mercur, Mercury, who is um, a symbol uh, for the, the stock, mark, stock exchange. So he's as well in the building that we saw in um, uh, um, Amsterdam. And Midas is a very known uh, fable here in the Turkey. So we fuse these two because Midas is representing state and Mercury is representing capital. And. My bad. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess basically we believe the two go hand in hand, even though. They claim they don't, and the media then has a lot to do with that, it partisanship and whatnot. Are you criticizing them? the relationship between state and capital? It is a commentary on it, yes. But then you are a prefer, would you prefer kind of a cap, uh, market that is not related to the state and therefore completely free? I would. I wouldn't make a, I don't, I'm not a fan of fixed statements. So let's say like, this is a comment, everybody can take what it, what they want. And whether the other one is better or not, it's kind of not proven. But I'm thinking. Well, I think that this is definitely not working how it is. So we can think about um, alternative models, but uh, not as a single person, but really as a community. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that's all good. Do we have any more questions from the crowd? Right. Any questions in Turkish even? No? Fantastic. Thank you very much again. That was amazing. Thank Round you. Of applause. And the golden symbol is mine. Okay, everyone. Now for the second part of the School of Consumption, we have our very own Ryan. Ryan, how are you feeling? That's a very big thumbs up. Are you ready to go? Take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so, um, my name is Ryan. Um, I was originally um, going to do this uh, presentation yesterday with the School of Value, um, but after uh, a mistake I made, uh, now I'm moving to the School of Consumption. So, we're going to uh, see, I'd love to hear your questions at the end, to see like how we can uh, connect between the previous talk to what I'm about to present. But it's kind of fitting I made a mistake because today I'm exploring the value of failure and the value of mistakes. So many errors shape history and our relationship with resources and capital. Our current assignment about alternative economic models and colonial trade routes between the Netherlands and Turkey began with an example from Anna Riddler. Her project, Mosaic Virus, portrays the value of the tulip being speculated and stretched 
during an economic bubble in the 17th century Netherlands. During our opening symposium of our research brief, she told us about how a virus created the stripes in tulips, which became the most valuable variation at that time. We see in this example that mutations, which in most circumstances are read as mistakes, can be sought out as luxury when they produce appealing aesthetics. This can also be observed in the research of Tally Reich, Daniela Kapoor, and Rosanna Smith, who found that consumers preferred products with mistakes than those intentionally produced. For example, chocolate whose, uh, whose uh, cacao was uh, burned or cooked longer than intended. Perhaps this is a value of uniqueness, of novelty. We may find that mistakes are rarely universally destructive or undesirable. For instance, when a mistake benefits those with more power, history can cover up the consequences. Christopher Columbus is a screw-up who can't read maps and couldn't find India. He is also someone whose mistake led to the massacre of millions of indigenous people. Another story chooses instead to focus on how this charming mistake eventually made way for the United States of America, whose 43rd president would also utter a falsity that led to immense violence. I'm speaking of George W. Bush and the mistaken perception of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I come from this country, a nation gifted at reframing failures into victories. I moved to the Netherlands in 2017 to begin my education and introduction to the design world and its language. Something designers like to talk about often is the value of failure. Making mistakes leads to a stronger, more indestructible project. However, as someone who failed my first year of school, I have learned a detail. It matters when and where you fail, in front of whom, and what that failure looks like. Fail fast, fail early, fail quietly, fail undetected, fail privately. Recently, I watched a video where Stefan Harris plays the vibraphone and explains the process of jazz improvisation. The exciting thing about jazz is how notes or syncopations that may sound out of key or rhythm may be innovations or they may be disasters. Let's hope this... Uh, this stays on while I, let's see. To the music. Okay. <laughs> One moment. Let's listen. The idea of a mistake, from the perspective of a, a jazz musician, it's, it's easier to uh, talk about someone else's mistake. <laughs> so, uh, I, the way I perceive a mistake when I'm on the bandstand, first of all, we don't really see it as a mistake. The only mistake lies in that I'm not able to perceive what it is that someone else did. Every mistake is an opportunity in jazz. Okay, so he says every mistake is an opportunity in jazz. Let's see. Hey, we're back. Okay, so. Many actions are perceived as mistakes only because we don't react to them appropriately. Now this brings me to finance. The financial crisis of 2008 was an accumulation of choices that were not reacted to appropriately. This had to do a lot with a group of enablers, institutions that allowed for unstable systems to be sustained by banks. Uh, I have a definition here. Enabling is removing the natural consequences of someone's behavior. Um, I'm taking this from a talk that I saw of Anat Admati, professor of Stanford University, who, talk, who wrote a paper called uh, It Takes a Village uh, to Crash the Economy or something like that. <laughs> um, so some of these enablers are called the big four audit firms, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, KPMG, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. They're the ones who are supposed to keep the banks from doing shady things. Big four audit firms have an oligopoly. They share complete control of the market. And each of them have been involved in numerous scandals that led to devastating economic consequences. So in 2009, PricewaterhouseCoopers were sued for uh, failed, failing to report Colonial Bank for buying inexistent mortgages, covering up overdrafts, and sweeping overnight money between accounts. In 2010, Ernst & Young were sued for failing to report Lehman Brothers for short-term repurchase agreements being classified as a sale, using this cash to pay down debt. Don't we love this uh, economic jargon that I don't even know? Uh, in 2013, KPMG was sued for failing to report Wells Fargo's improper sales practices and fake accounts. 
In 2018, Deloitte was sued for failing to report multi-billion billion dollar, oh, million pound fraud of UK software company Autonomy. So how does this happen? According to the Financial Times, we need clarity on the auditor's role. Well, I can explain a little bit more about that too. The big four accounting firms perform audits for corporations and banks. This is a process of assessing whether financial statements are a true and fair representation of the bank's or corporation's activity. Audit ideally assures stakeholders that the books and accounts are free from material misstatement. In actuality, audit can only really reduce the risk of misstatements being caused by fraud or error. So there's not much in an industry that assumes certainty um, and protection, there's actually a lot of risk involved. So auditors only actually have access to 5% of a company's data. Um, people are looking to artificial intelligence uh, as a way to uh, work through more data, but at this moment in time, due to uh, what, we have, what we're able to read through, um, that's really only what they can, they can manage. And because of this, according to the data from the International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators, 40% of audits that are inspected are found to be flawed. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners found that in 2017, auditors only picked up 4% of occupational fraud. Mistakes seem to be ingrained in the industry of audit. Knowing this, we might want to look closer at how we respond to mistakes. Before the 2008 financial crash, an audit firm could have a decades-long relationship with a bank that they audit. In order to build a relationship of interdependency with their clients, audit firms began providing other financial services to the banks. A firm would not only bring to the client's attention any misstatements, but they would also provide consulting on how to meet regulations better while making the most money. There's a highly criticized but overused metaphor in finance called the Chinese wall, which is an assumption that certain barriers can be created within an institution to prevent conflicts of interest. In history, the Great Wall of China was actually frequently breached by neighboring armies. These protections are not as impervious as one may assume. Perhaps instead of perpetuating metaphors based on structure, rigidity, information borders, we need to work with metaphors that are more fluid, flexible, adaptable to change, seeing that error is pretty ingrained in this industry. A wall won't ensure our safety, but rather a new culture of collaboration and rethinking ruptures safety and failure. So we're doing this broadcast to imagine alternative economic models. There's a lot of disagreement about how to deal with the corruption, uh, concentration of power, and conflicts of interest that the big four audit firms perpetuate. Many critics talk about splitting these firms into smaller companies, perhaps to how it looked before 2008. On the screen, I have a, a graph that shows um, sort of the distribution of capital and business between auditing firms in 2001. Uh, and then we see a huge change in 2014. So before it was uh, spread between a lot of different firms. Now it's very concentrated between the four of them. Um, and basically they changed the, um, the firms can no longer have decades long relationships with these banks, um, which, uh, so they changed the amount of time that they can have a relationship with them to five years but now everyone's like cycling through. So it's just rotating between the big four and corruption is still uh, possible. Um, in the Financial Times article, How to Fix the Big Four Auditors, they argue that rather splitting these firms, we should require joint audits, pairing big four with smaller non-big four firms. And there should be real time and continual audits rather than annual. Um, so I spoke with a person named Sol Trombovila from the Transnational Institute, a research and advocacy organization devoted to exposing injustices of transnational corporations. Sol wrote a paper called The Bailout Business, in which he describes the system of enablers who profit off of failures of banks. Um, let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, I had some interview clips, but I, I want to, uh, and they sound great, but I'm just going to describe what he said. Um, yeah, he was, he was talking about how um, uh, we basically have, when the banks fail, um, we look to the people who designed the system to fix it rather than, uh, you know, people who are affected by it, like kind of having more input. Um, and he's a part of this initiative called Fearless Cities, which highlights local movements throughout the world that provide solutions to deal with our big problems of today, crises of energy, housing, and water. We spoke about how radical municipalism could contend with big finance and audit, 
and that's a big next step with their research. That, that's actually one of their uh, finance will be the next thing that they address. So in thinking about how small systems can contend with big issues, um, I was reminded of uh, a book that I'm really enjoying right now called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown, where she advocates for movements to embrace the inevitability of change. Um, my next steps in this research are to dig deeper into the possibility of audit being performed simultaneously at a local and global scale, with each of them learning from each other. I wonder how mistakes can be addressed on a local level and what greater transparency about processes would change. So Adrian Marie Brown looks at fractal models, which are a never-ending complex patterns that are self-similar at different scales. You can see this with spiral patterns that appear both at the biological level and in the cosmos. I extend this to an embrace of failure and mutation, perhaps with the spirit of improvisation and collaboration between seemingly small and big players we can turn our catastrophes not into victories, but a participatory piece of art. How do we change our relationship to mistakes? How do we navigate the current identity crisis of the audit industry? If audit is an industry where mistakes are inevitable, how can we experience more transparency about how our financial system works? So I want to do an experiment with you all today. Um, I have some noise makers, so different musical instruments, which I believe John will help pass out. Um, so I will be improvising, um, doing some dance improvisation to a series of spoken objectives. It is highly imp improbable that I can perform this choreography correctly at this tempo and with no rehearsal. What I would like the audience to do is to make noise. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, I want the audience to make noise when I make a mistake that you do not like. I will make many mistakes, but it is up to the live audience here to communicate which mistakes are experienced by the radio audience. Um, okay, let's try this. Does everyone understand? So I'm going to uh, play a song and, uh, and video. I'm gonna explain some of the moves I'm gonna be doing, and then, uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, so here we go. And so the music we're gonna be listening to is a song in progress that I'm working on called Treadmill. Okay, so this is gonna be an uh, embarrassment, but I'm excited. <laughs> Right step, knee, body roll, slide, knee, pivot, pivot, slide, kick, kick, elbow, right step, bend, left step, slide, down, pivot, right step, knee, down, body roll, slide, right step, left step, right step, body roll, bend, pivot, elbow, down, right step, left step, bend, right step, bend, Pivot, left step, bend, right step, pivot, jump, left step, kick, elbow, slide, knee, left step, jump, bend. Okay. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. So I heard some noises in the crowd, which is good. Um, I felt like I was messing everything up, so I was expecting some more, but I'm curious what the radio audience heard, and uh, thank you for, for listening, everyone. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. I think we can all agree there's no mistake why you're here. Okay, do we have any questions for Ryan? Anybody in the audience got a question? Anybody in the audience got a question? Lauren, Lauren always has a question. Yeah, great research. Um, could you tell us a bit more about, um, 
I was interested in, in the auditing firms yeah. and how you described um, uh, that, yeah, now, now that they've even made changes to this law, that there's still an issue with this. Mm -hmm. um, and then the model that you proposed was to look at smaller, uh, a, a more local scale, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering, so do, is there like an example that you have so far of one of these local initiatives? You mentioned what Seoul was doing and the radical municipalities. Mm -hmm. do, they, do they have any sort of basic solutions that you came across? Um, I think what I talked about with Seoul is um, we talked a lot about the idea of transparency. Um, so it wasn't anything specific, like no specific examples but just the fact that working on a municipal level, um, people are much more engaged politically, I think, if um, people see the problems that are happening in their neighborhoods or their cities, they're, um, they're much more willing to go out and reach out to their representatives. It's also, perhaps, when it comes to thinking about mistakes, um, I think if we're working on things simultaneously at a, at a local, and um, using the local to help us understand what's happening on the global and national level, um, uh, maybe there, there's more room for experimentation, but also um, it's easier to see the connection between, um, between mistakes and consequences. Um, and that's something that's really missing in, um, in the big four audit right now, because um, mistakes are made all the time, and um, they're sued and sort of punished for for these errors, but um, it large uh, these lawsuits, the what they have to pay for those damages, um, is largely outweighed by how much um, how much they're making from their uh, consulting and audit um, work. So uh, there's just so much money involved in that, but it's a lot to uh, still explore. Yeah. Fantastic. Any more? Any more questions, for Ryan, on auditing and learning from mistakes? One more. Thank you very much. You mentioned about having these uh, big four companies to split to make them smaller or alternatively having uh, pairing them with a smaller company in the audit, right? Mm. Uh, in the second option, I really couldn't understand how we can benefit from that because the smaller company will follow the bigger ones and are they gonna audit each other or mm. how would that work? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think they'd have to, it would have to be some kind of system where it's not, um, the power differential is not so, um, I think if it, it was implemented as it is now, like you could sort of spoke of, the, it would be the smaller following the bigger, so there would still be that strong power differential. But I think there should be, um, the system should be made so that they can both, uh, yeah, check each other and audit each other. You know, a lot of people, when, also in, when people talk about splitting the firms, it's the idea of splitting the consulting from the audit because that seems to be where a lot of the conflicts come from and, um, and it's kind of a corrupt system. But, um, but yeah, the difficulty with that, I guess, is that they worry that um, fewer qualified applicants will go into that field of audit because consulting seems to be like a little bit more appealing or so, uh, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's uh, something I'm still learning a lot about in terms of ways people both in, in, the, in the industry and outside of it are um, thinking about how better to distribute those responsibilities and uh, powers. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that uh, probably wraps us up for the last day of the School of School of Schools. It's been the five day program. Ryan, it was amazing to end with you. Thank you very much. Um, Jack, I haven't given you much of an opportunity to MC uh, today. Oh, I can hear myself again. You haven't done what, sorry? I haven't really given you much of a, an opportunity. My microphone's been playing up. But hey, we've reached the end. Day number five is over. We've got more feedback than ever. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's crazy. Great feedback. Great feedback, everybody. So I hope our feedback from our tutors is just as good next week. <laughs> I agree. Because, you know, we deserve it. Looking at you two, thank you very much. And exactly how we rehearsed already, Jack? 
Do you yes. want to give us the roundup of the week so far? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, day number one, good. Day number two, okay. Day number three, good. Day number four, mm. Get day number five, hey, it's been a good day today. Just, just have, what was the just race what we rehearsed? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been amazing. Uh, hopefully you can see all these on the website, schoolofschoolschools.com. We'll have a podcast coming out very soon. It was wonderful being here. Thank you very much to Arthur for having us. Thank you very much for the Biennale for having us. Uh, yes. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who performed. Hey, thanks, everybody. You all deserved it, even though they're all here. <laughs> hey, well done. <laughs>